This morning, if you have your Bibles, turn back with me to Matthew, the sixth chapter, 16th chapter. I just want to read that 18th verse. I just want to read that 18th verse of Matthew, the 16th chapter. 18th verse, therein reads these words, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I shared with you on last Sunday that uh, about a month ago, we had a strategic planning session here at our church. 74 leaders from Mount Pleasant gathered uh, in a strategic planning session to see what it is that we needed to do to be able to uh, elevate, take this church to the next level to do what we need to do. Out of that strategic planning session, uh, our facilitator uh, for the day gave us an executive, an executive summary uh, on that planning session. And I wanted to be, we're gonna share it through our directors and uh, in your different ministries, but I wanted to be able to share with you personally uh, what I gleaned from that executive summary. And so I said that for the next three weeks, I would be sharing with you parts of that executive summary. I began on last Sunday, we talked about uh, I think it was five or six behaviors uh, that benefit the kingdom of God, that if we're going to build the kingdom of God, our vision here at the church is uh, building the kingdom of God one soul at a time. And I told you that uh, if there, we are going to do that, if we're going to build the kingdom of God, there are certain behaviors that, that we must uh, display, that we must show uh, to show that we're truly about building the kingdom of God. And this morning, for the second part, I want to look at how to overcome challenges. How to overcome uh, challenges. Uh, in our text this morning, uh, the Bible said Jesus comes to the region of Caesarea Philippi. And he asked the disciples, he said, listen, but what are the Poles saying about me? Well, what are the people out there talking about me? Who do people say that I am? They replied, some say that you are John the Baptist. Others say you are Elijah. Others say you are Jeremiah or maybe one of the prophets. But Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? I chose each one of you personally. I called each of you, pulled you out from your homes. So who do you say that I am? It was Simon Peter. Uh, this was one of his better moments. You know, Simon was often quick to speak and slow to think. He often put his mouth in motion before he put his mind in gear. Simon oftentimes uh, uh, just started talking without thinking. But this one time, Simon says, Thou art the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, <coughs> for this was not revealed to you. You couldn't get this in a classroom. You, you couldn't get this by knowledge. He, he said, Simon, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. He said, but my father in heaven. And this 18th verse is, was our foundation this morning. He says, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, on me, I will build my church. And here it is, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now notice, Jesus did not say they wouldn't try. S somebody will catch that when you get home. 
He, he did not say you, you're not going to have challenges, you're not going to have difficulties, you're not going to have problems. He said the gates of hell shall not prevail. And listen, this is not only just for us collectively this morning, <coughs> but it's also in our individual lives because the truth of the matter is, is even as individual Christians, Jesus said in this life, you will have some tribulation. I know there are people who think that just because I'm a child of God, I'm not going to have no problems. I'm not going to have any issues. Listen, don't believe that lie. Don't believe that lie. The truth of the matter is, is even as children of God, in fact, more so as children of God, because once you give your life to Jesus, there is an X put on your back. But the good news this morning, Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not. See, that's our joy. That's your reason to shout that no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're dealing with, you win in the end. The final word says it's going to be all right. And, and so the church is no different because we're in the church. <laughs> See, the reason the church has pro is because people who are sinful, <laughs> messed up themselves, all of us are sinners saved by grace. Yeah, and so since we, and, and just think, bringing all them folk together, <laughs> you are going to have challenges. But the good news is, that no matter what our challenges are, the Lord has said he can work it all out. And so we talked in our, we talked in our strategic session about some challenges that Mount Pleasant faces as we look to elevate. That's a word we'll be talking about a lot in 2020 is elevation, about elevating to where God wants us to be. And we talked about what are some challenges to us elevating. Uh, and we talked about a few of them, uh, resistance to change, lack of working together, not embracing the digital age, not thinking outside the box, afraid of change, a fixed mindset, a lack of faith. These are all challenges that we talked about. Uh, but the good news is we also talked, and we spent more time talking about solutions than we did challenges. Amen. Because I don't know about you, but I believe our God is a God of solutions. That's why he says we can do it for night, but what joy comes in the morning. That's the solution. The solution is that no matter what your problem is, your challenge is, God has already provided for you a solution to your problem. And so often we spend so much time talking about we are reactive instead of, I wish I had somebody here. Instead of being proactive, instead of saying, okay, what are some solutions that God has given us to face any challenge we may meet? And so this morning, I just want to talk about seven. We talked about, and like I said, this is all a part of that executive summary. We talked about seven solutions that will help us deal with any challenge that we may face. The first solution, brothers and sisters, is the first how you overcome a challenge, these solutions, seven. <clears throat> the first solution is obedience. Obedience, that's the first solution, is obedience. Acts 5, 29 says, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than man. Repeat after me, God, God. rather than than man. Amen. We must obey God because we don't have to answer to any man. I, listen, man, you can, man will disappoint you every time. We're not here to please man, and that's what happens a lot of times. Uh, we literally don't mind. We will do everything we can to please man, if it even means disobeying God. And I don't know about you, but I, 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 
I want to be able to stand before God and hear the words, good and faithful servant. Hear me, hear me. Obedience always brings blessings. Luke eleven twenty eight 28 says, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. It's why the word tells us obedience is better than sacrifice. God doesn't care what you give if you won't be obedient to him. God, well, Lord, I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I sacrifice my time, and I sacrifice, but are you obedient unto him? That's what God cares about. That, that, that's why the word says, uh, whatever you do, work it all with your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as your reward. Don't you know that if you would just make up in your mind to be obedient, that God has a reward for you, that whenever we are obedient to him, uh, obedient churches are blessed churches. Somebody missed that. Obedient church, and I'm not, and that's all aspects of obedience. That, that's obeying paying the tithe. God rewards tithing churches. Tithing churches don't have to worry about what it's going to cost to elevate, what, what it's going to cost to go to the next level because they have been obedient to him. And because of their obedience, it sure got quiet. <laughs> Time you talk about money, get quiet in the church. Don't you know Jesus talked about money more than anything else? Oh, y'all are a hard crowd. <laughs> we're going to overcome our challenges. We've got to make up in our minds that we're going to be obedient to God, God's word, God's order. And when we are obedient, God will bless. And so the first, the first solution to overcome challenge is obedience. The second, second solution to overcome challenge is not only must we be obedient, but there must be unity. If we're going to overcome challenges, there's got to be unity. Ephesians 4 and 3 says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. H hear this. A unified church can handle anything. A unified church can handle anything. When a church is unified, even when challenges arise, even when challenges show up, a unified church understands that upon this rock, a unified church understands that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. A unified church understands is that if we are together, nothing can stop us. Spirit rooted, Christ manifested, truth cherishing, humble, humility loving, unity is designed by God. See, see. This is why unity is important, because literally the church, the purpose of the church is to be a witness into the world and to show God and to give God the glory. That's literally why we're here, so that the world can, that's why Jesus, remember when he told Peter, upon this rock I'll build what? He said, my church. He didn't say, our church. <laughs> He didn't say our church. He said upon this rock I will build my church. I don't care. Listen, I don't care. And I got I probably got more keys in that. I got more keys to this church than anybody. I got a master key. I got key to this door, to that door. You know what? It don't mean one thing. I wish I had somebody here. He said, upon this rock I will build my church and and so if it's his church uh, we got to be under that's why listen that your house is what your house in your house it's now you 
How many folk in here let children make rules in? I remember I had gone away to college and I came home and you know, and I was in school, you know, I can't do what I want to do. I remember I was in school, I had been in school about three weeks and uh, Morehouse played, uh, Morehouse played Howard here in DC. And so, uh, so I, I, I decided I was gonna go come to Howard. And, and I don't know, something happened, my mother was, I was talking to her several weeks later and I was like, yeah, I was in D.C. She said, oh, 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 what, what? I said, yeah, I went to the Morehouse uh, Howard game. She's like, oh, you did, huh? She's like, uh, you, you want to call me and, you know, tell me? I mean, I, you know, something happened to you and I don't know where you are. I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm grown now. I ain't got to ask you. She said, oh. You grown now. <laughs> All right. Well, the next time you need some money, you're with your grown self. <laughs> you instead of calling me, you need to call your grown self. <laughs> and then, then, then I went home that summer. Now oh, I went home that summer. Now I'm grown now. You know, I ain't got no curfew in school. That means I ain't got no curfew here. I came strolling up in her house one morning about three thirty in the morning. I come strolling up in the house. Next morning, she came. She, she said, oh, come sit down at the table. I said, come on, have a seat. She said, let's, let's go ahead and get this over with right here, right now. She said, now listen, listen, listen. I know you were in school, and you done smelled yourself a little bit, and you think, you know, you think you're going to, but let me tell you something. As long as you in my house, as long as you in my house, you follow my rules. That means uh, don't walk through my door past a certain time. Uh, no, no, no. She said, now listen, you can go on back to Atlanta. <laughs> you can go live outdoors all I can. <laughs> but if you're going to be in my house, I wish I had somebody here. You're going to follow my rules. Listen, it's the same way in the Lord's house. If the, this Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. That means that it ain't for us to make up the rules and do what we want to do, how we want to do it. We've got to follow the word of God. And the word of God says you've got to be unified. If you're going to be a part of the body of Christ, you've got to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can't do it whatever all kind of way we want to do it. We're his witnesses. And listen, one, one of the great scourges on the church of today is the disunity. And I'm talking about in the ecclesia, in the body. You see it all over the news. The Episcopal church is disunified. The Presbyterian, all these churches are going through these different issues. I was talking to somebody. We wonder how come we ain't got no power. There are just in black Baptists, there are five different black Baptist conventions. Started off as one, but over the years, we've split four times. And then we call ourselves, and how do you think that makes God look? How do you think that makes Jesus look? He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, and we can't even come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. The solution is to be unified. The third solution, remember how to overcome challenges. Obedience, unity. Number three is we've got to be guided by the Holy Spirit. We got to be guided by the Holy Spirit. In everything that we do, we've got to let the Spirit guide us. And what I've learned is if you let the Spirit guide you, you can't go wrong. 
If you let the spirit guide you, let the spirit lead you, I'm a testimony that the spirit will never lead you down the wrong direction. But I wish I had somebody who could be honest. Every time you tried to do it by yourself, every time you tried to do it your way, you led yourself down a wrong path. Romans 8. Chapter says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Stop calling yourself a child of God and you got to have it your way. I wish I had somebody here. You talking about I'm this and I'm that and every decision you make in your life, everything you do for the Lord, if it ain't your way, you don't want to have no parts in it. And see, this is what I've learned. This is what I've learned. This is why we are so... This is why we are so adverse to being guided by the Holy Spirit. Because we are afraid of where the Spirit might take us. Yeah. Remember, remember, remember where it says, the thing about the Holy Spirit is you know not which way it's going. You don't know how it, I mean, it could just go anywhere. Thou knowest not the way that it goes. And see, when you live, when you give yourself over to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you don't know which way the Spirit is leading you. And see, that, to some of us, that makes us uncomfortable because you know, you know how we are. We're one of those people. We, I got to be in control. I got to know which way I'm going. You can't just tell me go somewhere. I need to know the directions. I need to know who going to be there. I need to know what we're going to do when we get there. I wish I had somebody here. We got to be in control. But when you make up in your mind to be guided by the Spirit, uh, listen, that means the Spirit will lead you down some paths uh, that you may not be able to see down, uh, but that if the Spirit is say, go that way, you got to go that way. I told you last Sunday, you remember it was Paul who wanted to go to Bithynia because, see, that's where the big lights were. It was going on in Bithynia. There were people, and Paul was a preacher. You know, we preachers, we like crowds. The mega church was in Bithynia. The people were in Bithynia. And here the spirit, the Bible says, but the spirit suffered him not. And instead of sending him to the mega church, the Lord sent him that little country church that don't even got central air and heat. In the summer, they got a ceiling fan that one of the deacons got to get up on a chair and pull the chain. And in the winter, they get uh, floor heaters. And Paul at this little bit of church, and all he can see over there in Bithynia is that mega church. Oh, they look like they got a parking lot full of people over there. And the Lord got me here in Troy. Ain't nothing here in Troas. Why? But that's where the Spirit guided him to. Thank God he was guided by the Spirit because it was in Troas that the Lord sent an angel to tell him, listen, your your see, I just wanted to see where you where you were because you know you could try the spirit by the spirit. I just wanted to see where your spirit was. This ain't your final journey. Your final journey is actually to go over to Macedonia and preach the word to the Gentiles. And the sage apostle Paul wrote over half the New Testament but the Lord had to send him to Troas first and the question is uh, will you be guided by the spirit will you go to some places you don't really want to go even though the spirit is leading you there because God is trying to elevate you God is trying I wish I had somebody here who's been there you had to do some things you didn't want to do but now you can testify thank God I was led by the spirit because look at me now Guided by the Holy Spirit. And this is this final word. Listen, the Holy Spirit equals power. You remember Jesus in Acts said, and you shall receive power. 
after the Spirit has come upon you. So the Holy Spirit equals power. No spirit equals what? No power. You missed it. The Holy Spirit equals power. No spirit equals no power. The reason that many churches and the reason that the ecclesia, the body of Christ, does not have the power it ought to have to make a look at all this stuff going on in our world. People are looking for somebody with hope. People are looking for an answer and the church has what we need the church has what the world is looking for but because we ain't got no power because we have not given ourselves completely over to the power of the holy spirit our solution is to be guided by the spirit our next next solution to our challenges not only must we be obedient and have unity, be guided by the Spirit, but the fourth thing is we must accept God's will. That's one of the hardest things for us to do in our lives is to accept God's will. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all my heart. Lean not to thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall what? He shall direct your path. We got to get to a place in our lives that we accept God's will. Even as a church, God has a plan for each and every person sitting in this sanctuary this morning. In fact, God has you here in Mount Pleasant for a reason. It's up for you to fulfill your purpose, to figure out why it is that God has you here and what can I do to make sure that I'm walking and talking and living in the will of God. And see, what you got to get in your mind, that his plan is bigger than my plan. That his plan is better than my plan. That his plan makes more sense than my plan. Because see, what happens too often is uh, we think our plan outweighs God's plan. Uh, but anybody here can be honest. Uh, listen, God can see some stuff I can't see. Uh, God knows some things I don't know. I don't care how educated you are. I don't care how much money you have in the bank. Uh, I don't care what kind of clothes you wear. What kind of car. Listen, God's plan will always be bigger than your plan. That's why Paul said, press on toward the mark. You got to keep pressing and accept where you are and who you are. And even though it may not make sense to you, accept God's will. There's some preacher here this morning who will be honest, they ran from it for a long time. But what, it wasn't until they accepted that this is God's will for my life. And see, what happens is when you start accepting God's will, then God begins to elevate you and you begin to do things you didn't even imagine yourself doing. You ask yourself, how in the world did I get where I am? It's because you accepted God's will for who you are and God began to push you. God, see, too many of us are... See, what's happening is we are literally pushing against God. You, you missed that. We are pushing against God. I, I had gone to get my tire changed one time, and the people who put the tire on used one of those electric blowers to put it on. And the socket was so tight. I mean, I sat there and I tried and I tried and I tried. And I realized finally that no matter how hard I try, I ain't getting this little nut off. It got so bad that I took it to somebody. They ended up stripping it and then we had to literally cut the whole piece off. All because if somebody had put it on too tight. And that's how a lot of us are in our lives. We, we are, I mean, God, if God doesn't tighten that thing so, 
and here you are, instead of just accepting God's will for your life, you are literally trying to, and, 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 and after I fought with that tire for about an hour, my whole body hurt. I said, I must be getting old or something. Good God, I didn't realize. I mean, literally, I, you know, when I was doing it, I didn't feel nothing. But I, when I finally got in the house and sat out, I said, Lord Jesus. <laughs> my body hurting from my pinky toe to the top of my head. And that's how it is when you fight against the will of God. Listen, stop boxing with God. Your arms ain't long enough. You're going to lose every time. You're going to lose every time. Just accept God's will for your life. And the sooner you accept God's will for your life, the sooner you will be in a position to have God begin to elevate you, to take you not where you want to go, but to take you to where God wants you to go. We're going to overcome our challenges. We must accept God's will. But the next thing, if we're going to overcome our challenges, not only must we be obedient, not only must we be unified, uh, we must be guided by the Spirit. There must be an acceptance of God's will. But the, the fifth thing is, we must have a growth mindset. Being in I've been in church pretty much most of my life. And one thing I've come to realize is that some people, some people are content with where they are, and they really don't want to grow. They tell you, listen, I don't need all, I'm, I'm fine right where I am. And there are people in church, they don't want more people. They don't want a family life center. They don't want to do this. They don't want that because, no, we are right just where we are. Listen, you can't have that mindset. In fact, 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. <laughs> Paul said, I planted, Apollo's water, but it was God who made it grow. You see, what we got to understand is we are not in control of the growth. We're responsible. Our responsibility is the planting and the watering. But what happens is we don't even want to do our part. Hmm. I told you last Sunday that Acts 2 is one of it's probably the best chapter. If you want to look at what church ought to look like, go to Acts 2. Acts 2 tells us exactly what church ought to look like. Acts 2, starting at around that 42nd verse down to the 47th verse, it says all the things that they did. They followed the apostles', the apostles doctrine. They prayed together. They worshiped together. They sold all their goods so that they may give to those in need. They went from house to house breaking bread. And after they did all of those things, the Bible says in that last verse in the second chapter, and the Lord added to the church daily. They didn't have to come up with no scheme. They didn't have to come up with no, see, I, I feel this church up every Sunday. All I got to do is get on the radio and say, I'm going to be putting oil on people at the altar. And there's ain't nothing wrong with that. But that ought not be your sole reason for coming to church. You could come up with all kind of schemes to get people to come to church. But, but that, listen, growing in the Lord ought to be enough for you. The, having the word and, and receiving the word and hearing the word and living my life by the word ought to be enough. We just do our part. He said, I planted Apollos watered. God gave the increase. We, we got to get out of this mindset of, of, of a limited, because see, I don't know about you, 
but I serve a big God. Oh, I ought to have more amens right there. I serve a big God, and my God can do all things. And, and so I just made up in my mind, there's nothing too hard for God. And so if we would just make up in our mind that all things are possible with God, that whatever it is that we want, whatever it is that we need, if we just do our part and let God do his part, you see, our problem is we want to play God. Hmm. This is not just for the church, but this is even for our own individual lives. We want to be so in control that we want to even control the growth. It don't work that way. Everything you have, God gave you. Everything you are, God made you. Everywhere you've gone in your life, it was nobody but God who brought you. And listen, we've got to have that mindset in church that if we just open ourselves up to him, I have not seen nor hear and heard what is in store. For the people of God. Think. This is the last thing on this. Question is, is how are you going to handle your obstacles? See, we, you have a choice. As God is elevating you, the truth is, is you're going to have all of us. I don't care who you are. Every, listen close, listen close. If, you, if, if, you, if, if, if you're not here, wake up. Everybody in this church is either had some obstacles, is either dealing with some obstacles, or is going to face some obstacles. I don't care who you are. All of us have to deal with some obstacles. The question is, uh, when your obstacles come, are you going to make them opportunities or are you going to allow the obstacle to stop you? You see, that's what happens to too many of us. We are on our journey. We're pressing on toward the mark. Everything is going good. Everything is going well. I answer my phone, a Holy Ghost headquarters. Oh, people see me. I'm too blessed to be stressed. Oh, baby, how you doing? Oh, I'm wondrously safe. I didn't ask you all that. I just asked you how you was doing. But you so doing well in your walk with God that everything is just going good but then all of a sudden you go to the doctor and you got an obstacle all of a sudden you got a bill that you've got more bill than you've got more money an obstacle somebody in your family dies obstacle children in trouble Obstacle. And the question is, what's your next move? Are you going to throw in the towel? Are you going to give up? Are you going to say, I'm not going to allow this obstacle to stop me, but I'm going to use this obstacle as an opportunity. I wish I had somebody here as an opportunity to go even higher in the Lord. I'm going to use this obstacle as a springboard for my blessing. Oh, I wish I had somebody here who's ever been there in your life. They thought that obstacle was going to stop you. They had already started writing your obituary. They had already started writing you off but you made up in your mind if God brought me this far I wish I had somebody who knows he'll never leave you nor forsake you and I'm not going to let this obstacle stop me but it'll be my opportunity to elevate it'll be my opportunity to elevate it'll be my opportunity to elevate It'll be my opportunity to elevate. It'll be my opportunity to elevate to be who God wants me to be. Listen, you've got to have a growth mindset that I can do whatever it is that God would have me to do. If we're going to overcome our challenges, got to be obedient, got to be unified, guided by the Holy Spirit, accept God's will, have a growth mindset. Number six is a hurry on. We've got to have increased faith. Got to have increased faith. 
the, uh, Luke 17 and 5, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Increase our, listen, every day when you pray, your prayer ought to be, Lord, increase my faith. Increase my faith, God. Increase my faith. Increase my faith. Increase my faith. Increase my faith when it gets hard. Increase my faith when I'm sick. Increase my faith when I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. Increase my faith when my marriage is on the rocks. Increase my faith when, when I'm going through. Increase my faith when I lose my job. Increase my faith when I don't know how I'm going to make it. Lord, increase my faith. And God, Romans 10 and 17 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Listen, three quick things. If you're going to increase your faith, first of all, you got to read the word. You got to read the word. Everybody say, read the word. You got to read the word. If you're going to increase it, see, there's something about an increased faith. There's something about when you pray, Lord, increase my faith, and you start reading the word of God, all of a sudden stuff starts coming out. You you didn't even know was in there. I mean, you're going through on your job, and all of a sudden you start hearing at the back of your head, weeping and doing for for a night but joy cometh in the morning. You, you, you start hearing the Lord is my light and my salvation. I wish I had somebody. You, you start hearing I can do all things through Christ Jesus. You didn't even know but you started getting serious about reading the word and every time you had a problem, every time you had a challenge, the word just started coming. I wish I had somebody here who knows the more you take it in, the more it comes out in your life. got to read the word, but not only got to read the word, but got to heed the word. That's why James says be doers of the word, not just hearers, but doers also. You got to heed the word, but then you got to test the word. That's, that's, and and listen, I'm not going to talk about money no more, but you remember Malachi? The Lord says, try me. He said, that's all he said, try me. He said, you know what's written. I've told you what's written. You know it's here. All I ask you to do now is just test me. He said, and if you test me, I will open up the windows of heaven. If he'll do that for money, what else will he do that for? All you got to do is test him. All you got to do is try him. And the Lord has promised that he shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Listen, I'm done. There are challenges. But we can overcome those challenges with obedience. We can overcome those challenges with unity. We can overcome those challenges by being guided by the word, by accepting God's will, by having a growth mindset, by having increased faith. But the last thing, if we can overcome these challenges, there is a new harvest. You remember in Luke 10, it says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two told them to go out, for he said the harvest is plentiful. Listen, the harvest is still plentiful. Souls still need to be saved. Lives still need to be changed. People still need to be turned around. That was a day when, you know, you could just open up the doors of the church and people would come. We're not living in that day no more. There are many things that are trying to grab their attention. And so that means the church has to make up in its mind. If we want to get the harvest, we got to go get them. That's why evangelism is so important. I tell the time, it's amazing to me. Jesus, as he was about to ascend back to glory, he could have talked about a whole, some of these things that we argue about in the, you got denominations splitting over this and splitting over that. And you figure Jesus could have settled some of that stuff before he went back to glory. But Jesus ain't got time for all that. His two lasting statements as he's about to ascend back to glory. Matthew 28, he said, go ye therefore evangelize. Acts, he said, and you shall be my witnesses evangelize. So what is that telling us? That's telling us if we want the harvest, we got to go get them. Listen, the truth is, is people don't come to church the way they used to come. People don't. It, studies say that even just some 10, 12 years ago, people went to church three out of five Sundays in the month. 
three out of every five Sundays, people went to church. Studies say now that people go to church one out of every two Sundays, out of every five Sundays. And that's people who saved. <laughs> so you may not get the unsaved person, but every once in a while. But if you go out and get them, if you make up in your mind that it's important enough for us to reap the harvest, he said, you just do your part, and I'll do my part. Are there challenges? Yes. But thank God the Lord has given us solutions. And if we just make up our minds to follow these solutions, God is going to elevate this church. We can't even imagine where God will take us. Eyes can't imagine where God will take us if we just follow his solutions. We pray that you've been blessed by today's message. Please join us again next week for another powerful word from God. For prayer requests or to order a copy of today's program, write to us at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, 2516 Squirrel Hill Road in Herndon, Virginia, 20171. That's Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, 2516 Squirrel Hill Road in Herndon, Virginia, 20171. You can also visit us on the web at www.mountpleasantbaptist.org. Until we meet again, remember, God's world, our mission field.